Hey, what's up, YouTube? Welcome back to the channel. This is vlog number two. And in this one, I head to Thunder Valley Casino Resort, just outside of Sacramento, California. So this vlog is really fun. I get put in some really tricky spots. I also decide to play bigger, which makes for some bigger swings, some bigger pots, could be some bigger wins, could also be some bigger losses. Also, make sure you stick around for the entire vlog because the last hand of the vlog is the hand of the session really fun. I want you to see it. Let me know what you think in the comments below. Also, before we get into it, make sure you hit that like and subscribe button and make sure you click that notification bell to be in the loop anytime I drop new content. With that being said, let's get right into the vlog. Welcome back to the channel. This is vlog number two. And today we find ourselves at Thunder Valley Casino Resort and Hotel, just outside of Sacramento, California, in a city called Lincoln. So the plan today was to play in the 1-3 game, which are my typical stakes. But upon my arrival in the poker room, I got a feeling. And that feeling was, today we wanna to play bigger. I'm playing well, I'm making good decisions, I feel like I'm in a really good spot, and truthfully, I'm just feeling spicy. I'm ready to play, I'm looking to play some bigger pots, and I'm looking to take a shot. And for those reasons, I decided to jump in the 2-5 game, and I'm in to start for 500. As always, before we get into the hands, please take a moment, hit that like and subscribe button, and make sure you click that notification bell, that way you'll be in the loop anytime I drop new content. So at this time, I've been in the game a little bit more than an hour and not too much has happened. I've been in some small to medium sized pots, but nothing major. That is until this hand, where we pick up the first prominent hand of the vlog, where I find myself in the small blind and I look down at ace king off. So this hand's gonna have an under the gun straddle to $10 and the action's gonna eventually fold around to me in the small blind and I want to get this pot heads up if possible, and I'm going to be out of position. So due to those two things, I decided to size up my raise here, and I make it $50. So now I glance over at the small and the big blind, and I notice that the big blind already seems like he wants to fold, which is great. But as I look at the small blind, he seems very intense, very stern, and he seems like he's really pondering a decision. So he definitely does not decide on a call. He actually elects to re-raise and he re-raises to $175 total. So yeah, <laughs> this is not a great situation for us to be in. 
So this is my very first three bet of the entire session, especially the size and the position. I'm doing this against two opponents, which should show a lot of strength. And for this opponent to re-raise me here also shows he's probably at the very top of his range. If I have ace king suited here, given the size of the pot and what I have left in my stack, it's just an automatic jam. But versus an unknown opponent to whom I don't know which hands he's able to do this with, ace king offsuit becomes very mediocre at best, especially when all the money gets in preflop. For example, if I knew this opponent was able to do this with other ace x holdings or maybe tens jacks queens, I would feel much better about getting ace king in. So I ultimately decide to fold and look for a more profitable spot later on in the session when I have more accurate reads. So I was never able to find out what the player had in that hand, so I really don't know if I made the right fold with ace-king off there. Let me know what you guys think. Did I make the right play? Did I make the wrong play? Let me know in the comments. I'd be curious to know your perspectives. About three or four orbits later, I get to my next playable hand. This hand just confirms my suspicion that the poker gods are indeed real because they give me a second chance to try to win with ace-king off. This time, they give it to me on the button. So in this hand, we have a raise to 20 from middle position, and then just a flat call from the cutoff. Now, both of these players have been very loose and splashy. They can have a lot of different holdings. And this is a great spot just to squeeze in general, being in position, especially with the cutoff's range being capped by just calling here. So I settle on a three bet to $70. Now, I would be happy to take this pot down right now uncontested and just take what's in the middle. Otherwise, if the pot is going to continue with these villains, I don't want to see it multi-way, especially with a drawing hand such as ace-king off, so I want to get it heads up if need be. So the action is going to fold back to the initial raiser, who's going to think about it for not too long, and he's eventually going to decide to make the call here to continue. Now, we all know what's going to happen in this scenario next. Once the initial person calls, that's going to bring in the cutoff, who's going to believe she's getting the right price to try to peel and hit her hand. So now this is one of the worst situations, what I really didn't want to have happen. Now I'm gonna to have to see this flop three ways and I'm gonna to have to spike to try to continue. So now we're going three ways to a flop with 210 in the middle and the flop comes king a3 rainbow. Now the initial raiser is gonna think for a little while. I actually thought he was gonna do some sort of a block bet here because I saw him do this in some other previous hands but he decides on a check, and then the cutoff also quickly checks. Now at this point, I'm pretty sure I have the best hand, so I just want to get some value. So I decide on a half pot sizing, as I bet $110. Now the action is going to quickly fold, so both players just probably didn't have much. But it's always good. I'm going to take this one down. So I'm one for one with ace-king on the day. So moving along to the next hand of the vlog, I look down at queen jack offsuit in the cutoff and the action's going to fold to me. This is a standard open for me here with an offsuit broadway. It's not the best hand in the world, especially if I get raised, but if I don't, then it's a hand I can play well post flop because I'm in position, I can keep the pot small, or if I happen to hit the flop hard, I can put in the last bet. So we're going to see this flop three ways and the flop comes queen h6, two spades. There's many times in a poker session that I look back and wonder why I did something. And this is clearly one of those spots. This is just an obvious continuation bet here for value. I have top pair, decent kicker. I can get value from an eight, a six, various draws. It's just an obvious spot. And I just tried to be a little too deceptive and it's gonna come back and bite me later on. But I don't want to be results oriented, but I still just think it's an automatic bet here. And I just tried to be a little too deceptive. And the turn comes the five of clubs. Now the small blind is going to lead here for $25. This is very strong given that he's leading into two people at a position. And speaking of strength, now the big blind is just going to smooth call the 25. So at this time, I don't love the situation. I have a lot of alarm bells going off. But I also did check back the flop, so I'm underrepped. So both of these players can't put me on top pair. So I think I have to call once here and evaluate. And the river comes the four of spades. 
Now, literally this run out keeps getting worse and worse and I just try to knuckle and hopefully have my top pair being good as literally every draw basically got there. And not to my surprise, the small blind flips over 10-7 of hearts for a rivered straight. So looking back at it, I don't think my continuation bet on the flop would have worked anyways. But in general, in theory, I still would have liked the bet there as I still think it's positive EV over time. In this next hand, I'm in late position and I look down at pocket force. So with the sailboats here, we have an early limper and I decide to size up to 25 to accommodate for that. The action is going to eventually fold all the way over back to the limper who's going to decide to make the call. So we're going to go heads up to a flop with a little bit more than 50 in the middle and the flop comes 5-5 five, five, deuce, two spades. The action is going to quickly check over to me and I decide to make a merge bet here of $30. The thought is my fours most likely are still good, but if he happens to have overs with a lot of equity, I want to try to deny those if possible. And the turn comes the ace of clubs. This is a very bad card for me as a lot of his floating range contains aces, especially a lot of his calling range pre. So for that reason, I decide to check back. And the river comes the eight of clubs. Now this is another card that's not great for us here. Now backdoor clubs also get there. I do have one club in my hand, so I kind of block some combos. But now this player bets here almost the size of the pot. He goes 100 into 110. It's not great. At this point, I can only beat an absolute bluff. I haven't seen this player get out of line too much. And I'm just trying to think what I can really beat. So I ultimately decide that I can't beat much. This is a marginal spot at best versus an unknown player who I have no idea what kind of tendencies he has. Nine times out of ten, this is just going to be a monster. But if he's bluffing me, well, nice hand. But I elect to wait till later on in the session when I get a little bit more information. Moving on to the last hand of the vlog, I decided to save the most entertaining hand for last. So in this hand, we have a straddled pot to 10 and the action is going to fold over to me in middle position and I look down at pocket kings. So I make a standard raise to 40 and the action is going to fold over to the button who's going to decide to cold call a 40. So I was a little surprised that the button decided just to flat call here. Um, we weren't that deep. So I was expecting either a raise or a fold, but I have a monster, so I don't mind it. But this is going to bring in the straddler who's going to put in the remaining money because he's getting a price. So we're going to go three ways to a flop here with 120 in the middle and the flop comes 649 rainbow. So the action is going to start with a check over to me. Now this is a great flop for Kings. So I want to keep some players in this pot as well. Some top pair holdings, maybe some over pairs, some draws. So I don't need to blast it. So I choose a sizing of 60 here. So the button is not going to think about it for too long. And he's going to decide to make the call. And the straddler is going to release and just get out of the way. So now we're going to be heads up to the turn with $240 in the middle. And the turn is the five of diamonds. So I decide to check it over to the button and just evaluate. I'm not necessarily as scared of the five. I just kind of wanted to see what he wanted to do because he's been very solid all day. Hasn't gotten out of line. And he decides to lead for $135, which is pretty big based on the pot and his actions throughout the day. So it's possible here that he has a monster. He could have flopped a set. He could have hit a gut shot of seven, eight, possibly on the turn. And if he did, well, <laughs> he did. It's kind of one of those things that sometimes you get into a mode where you have a monster and you're just not going to fold. They're just going to have to show you a bigger monster. And that's literally where I'm at in this session. There's no way I'm folding kings. I'm just thinking, should I rip it now? Should I call? And I ultimately decide on a call here of the 135. And I'm going to call pretty much any river. And well, if he has me, he has me. And I'll just do the drive of shame. So with $510 in the middle, we're going to see a river, which is the king of clubs. So now we basically spike gin. I can beat any hand except 7-8. And well, we already talked about that. If he has 7-8, well, congratulations to him. He's just going to get the money. So it's a no-brainer here. I decide to rip it for my remaining $171.
So at this point, I'm just hoping and praying for a call here. I know I have the best hand, and now this player goes deep into the tank. So this player is going to think about it for a very long time, but he is eventually going to decide on a fold. So unfortunately, we don't get the full double there, but we do take a very nice pot as we get ready to close out our session. Welcome back, everyone. So to recap the session at Thunder Valley, I was in for 500 and I cashed out for 1086 which is a profit of $586 on the session. All right, so that's going to do it for vlog number two. I appreciate you guys stopping by. If you enjoyed the content, please consider giving me a like and a subscribe. I would really appreciate it. It helps the channel, helps the algorithm with YouTube. And these vlogs do take a lot of time and effort, so it goes a long way. One quick announcement. I am working on vlog number three. It will be out soon, so be on the lookout. It's going to take place at my local card room where a majority of my vlogs will probably happen from. All right. Again, thank you guys so much. Take care. Be safe. Run good. And I'll catch you on the next one.